Welcome, Fritjof. It's absolutely wonderful to have you join me here on this conversation about COP26. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting here with you today. I'm here on the land of the Gubby Gubby people on the banks of the Mookaboola River, um, otherwise known as Crystal Waters Permaculture Village. So for the viewers and listeners, I'd just like to uh, give a brief introduction to Fritjof. So Fritjof is a renowned scholar activist who's been working for decades in this space of educating around um, climate change, around ecological worldview, about systems thinking, an international um, best-selling author who has a new book out called Patterns of Connection, essays, essential essays from five decades, uh, which we recently did a, a conversation about talking about what's in that book as well. So um, thank you for accepting my invitation to reflect on what's been going on in the world right now that's been in everyone's minds and everyone's conversations. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, Morak. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, give you my perspective on uh, the uh, Climate Summit COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, I want to say right at the beginning that I share this perspective with many scholars and activists. I want to acknowledge especially Hazel Henderson, uh, Bill McKibben, uh, George Mombio, uh, David Corton, and Vandana Shiva all of whom have very strongly influenced my thinking. So the latest climate report by the IPCC has told us that we need to cut emissions in half by the end of this decade in order to have any hope of achieving a limitation of global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius as pledged in the Paris Agreement. At COP26, we have heard about complex promises and mechanisms for achieving this goal. But in fact, the basic requirement is very simple. We have to keep fossil fuels in the ground. That's all there is to it. In spite of this clear goal, and in spite of the fact that we have the technologies and the financial means for the transition to renewable energy sources, most governments with major fossil fuel reserves plan to continue exploiting them and even to increase the drilling for oil and natural gas. And in this way, they threaten the very survival of human civilization. And this is true even for nations like the United States, who claim to be at the forefront of the transition to renewable energies. Even here, they plan on increasing the drilling for oil. In 2020, governments around the world spent $450 billion in direct subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. While investments in clean energy by that same industry amounted to just about 1% of their total expenditures. This means that almost everything set at COP26 by powerful governments is a distraction from the central goal of keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And in fact, destruction is a big business in Glasgow. I just learned the other day that uh, there are 503 fossil fuel lobbyists accredited to the climate summit. Incredibly. This is a number larger than any national delegation. So why do our political and corporate leaders spend all these billions of dollars on the destruction of life on earth? Well, the reason is that politics in most parts of the world is dominated by corporate interests. In other words, there's widespread systemic corruption. And at the core of corporate interests, there is an obsession 
with unlimited growth, with the irrational illusion that perpetual economic and corporate growth are possible on a finite planet. Economists today identify economic success with GDP growth, regardless of whether real value is either created or destroyed in the process. Money, rather than the well being of people and of the community of life, has become the defining measure of value in our global economy. In this economic system, perpetual growth is pursued relentlessly by promoting excessive consumption and a throwaway economy that is energy intensive, generating waste and pollution, depleting the Earth's natural resources, increasing economic inequality, and driving the climate emergency. In the words of activist and author David Corton, money is useful as a tool, but becomes dangerous when embraced as a purpose. We will prosper in the pursuit of life, or we will perish in the pursuit of money. The choice is ours. That really says it all for me. Now, of course, growth is not all bad. In fact, growth is a central characteristic of all life. But growth in nature is neither linear nor unlimited. While certain parts of organisms or ecosystems grow, others decline, releasing and recycling their components, which become resources for new growth. This kind of multifaceted balanced growth is very well known to biologists and ecologists. And I like to call it qualitative growth to contrast it with the concept of quantitative growth measured in terms of this undifferentiated index of the GDP used by today's economists. Qualitative growth is growth that enhances the quality of life by continual generation and regeneration. It includes an increase of complexity, maturity, and sophistication. Now, today, we have the science and the technology and we also have the financial means to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, from quantitative extractive growth to qualitative regenerative growth. Let me just give you two examples. The most effective way to reduce emissions is to replace the combustion of coal, of coal, oil, or natural gas by electricity, electricity generated with solar energy. And to do this for all our energy needs. Now, totally electrifying, for example, the United States would reduce our energy use by about 50%. Why? Because simply Electricity is so much more efficient than combustion. It would also save us a lot of money because solar generated electricity is the cheapest power source. Renewable energy sources are now uh, the cheapest available. And of course, the whole transition and restructuring to electricity would create millions and millions of jobs. My second example is about planting trees. A recent study by scientists, scientists at the prestigious Swiss university known by its initials, German initials ETH, has shown that there's enough suitable land around the world to plant 1.2 trillion trees. And of course, the study also showed 
which trees to plant where and in which season and so on, so that the whole enterprise is, is effective. This, they estimated, would remove two thirds of all carbon emission emitted during the whole history of humanity. So we have the solution. But you see, advancing scientific arguments and documenting technological achievements is not enough. It's not enough because our so-called world leaders are not interested in reason and evidence. They're interested in money and in power. And this means that we also need political activism. Now, fortunately, there are now millions of activists around the world who have chosen the pursuit of life, in David Corton's words, the pursuit of life instead of the pursuit of money. From youth movements like the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Fridays for Future, and so on, to the more recent fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty proposed by thousands of scientists, to movements like Europe Beyond Coal or the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance started by Denmark and Costa Rica. These movements are making their voices heard at Glasgow and they need our support. They embody the political will and leadership that we need for overcoming the climate crisis and for protecting the con continuation and flourishing of life on earth. So that in a nutshell is my perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Fritjof. And what you say about the, the need for this energy transition and the reforestation of our planet being you know, one of the, the the reforestation being one of the simplest and most accessible ways to reverse climate change. Um, I know you've also talked in the past about uh, the need to focus uh, differently on on our food system. Could you just mention briefly what your perspective on that is? Absolutely. Well, uh, to begin with, we need to realize something that is not generally discussed, and that is that. We need to radically reduce our uh, emissions, but also there is already too, not, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. So we need to be able to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. And the only way is with the photosynthesis in plants like the one behind you here, in trees and in organic soil. Organic soil is a living soil and carbon is the chemical backbone of life. Therefore, organic soil continually draws down carbon from the atmosphere and locks it up in organic substances. And this is the only technology we know. The technology that has been proven for billions of years that, that works to draw down CO2. And as this Swiss study says, this massive planting of trees, which is, which is also by far the cheapest way uh, of, of um, re reducing the CO2, you know, is, is the way to go. Now, for me, agroecology or uh, regenerative farming or organic farming, sustainable agriculture, all, all these terms really describe the same uh, approach uh, is the uh, grand, grand example of what I call a systemic solution to our problems. That is a solution that doesn't see any problem in an isolated way, but connects it with the other problems and therefore solves several problems at the same time. So if we were to shift massively not only from fossil fuels to renewables, but also from industrial agriculture to agroecology, this would solve or, or help to solve at least three major problems. First, it would have a huge impact on uh, our energy consumption because industrial agriculture spends about 
20% of all the fossil fuels, at least in the United States, on growing, transporting, and processing food. And, and agroecology doesn't have that massive energy input. The organically grown food, of course, would have a tremendous impact on public health because we know that, that many of our uh, serious diseases are a direct consequence of our diet. And finally, as I said before, it would draw down CO2 from the atmosphere and help alleviate the climate crisis. So uh, agriculture and the planting of trees to me are you know, essential elements of a climate strategy. And it's very sad to see that uh, there are all these climate activists on the one hand, and there are a lot of activists about uh, sustainable agriculture, whole foods and you know healthy eating, healthy lifestyles and, and so on. And the two don't connect or at least connect very little. So I think we need to form coalitions between people interested in sustainable regenerative agriculture and uh, people uh, developing climate policies. That's extremely important. Thank you. And I was, one final question was that um, as you were, in your first reflection, you were talking about we need to support activists. What, in your words, would be the best way that you feel that we can support? So those who are listening, what's the best way to support the activists who are stepping up and stepping out and speaking up about this? Well, I, I have two suggestions. One is for our youth to join them, which is very easy because all our youth are interconnected in social media and they all have their social networks. So join the activist groups, find out who they are and join them. That's the simple thing. Uh, the other thing is that I have noticed that these climate activists have all the right values and have tremendous energy and they also have great skills uh, of organizing. And on the other end of the age spectrum, we have a group of senior, of, of elders, like the ones I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, and, and there are many others. And we have worked for many decades to develop a, con a systemic conception of life that is completely consistent with the goals of the young activists. So we can tell those young activists that uh, the forefront of modern science is supporting what they do and is providing a conceptual framework that undergirds what they are doing. And so my dream is to make this connection between you know, young, active, uh, very energetic activists and then uh, the older scholars who have to uh, develop the wisdom of systemic thinking. That's, that's what I'd like to see. I share that dream too. And with, with that thought, I thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your reflections You're on welcome. what's going on in the world right now. And um, so much food for thought there. And as you're saying, some very tangible and accessible ways that we can all be part Absolutely. of what's Thank going on. Thank you very much, Morag. Thank you, Fritjo.